could this be the first ever fishing vlog from inside the Bernabeu? I have no idea, but guess what? It's Thursday night, it's Friday tomorrow, let's talk about fishing. big thanks again for all the questions that have been coming in again this week it's uh, it's great and it's really a bit of an eye-opener because a lot of the questions you'd imagine would be quite high level but a lot of them are really quite low level questions just down to what sort of kit that we use and it's just nice to throw the answers out there on a, on a vlog like this because you know it some of the questions rather than just inbox them or send them via, via email by putting them on here everybody can can uh, you know can see what sort of kit that I'm using and the people that I know are using so it's just a, a really good way of sharing information uh, I thought I'd do the Q&A's three questions again but I thought I'd do them while we're at, while I'm away and uh, we've just walked down from um, from the uh, from the cathedral and the palace in Madrid we've just been told we really ought to get down and have a look at the river and it's not really what I expected to be fair so I thought I'd bring you down here just to show you the river it's quite it's quite a small river to be honest I thought it was gonna be like with obviously a, a major city like this you think it would be a raging river you know like the Trent or some like all the Thames but it's not at all um, it's a bit like their River Don like what we've got in Sheffield um, but we're just down here I mean this is the bridge the main bridge that goes over the river like I say we're, ju we're just down the hill from uh, from from the cathedral and the crypt and um, you walk down the steep hill obviously down into the valley where the river is but just have a look at this a lot of this is done like really for flood flood defense and stuff so um, I'm not sure if I can go through here but I'm going to anyway just to show you it's obviously quite low at the minute but look at this really nice I assume it looks completely different in the summer that's looking up not much water here but if you guys are interested the water runs down that far side but yeah I mean it's a beautiful city first question is about getting networked up I've been asked loads of questions all the time about how I know about the matches that are taking place uh, where they're taking place and when tickets go on sale it's all about getting networked up it's really quite as simple as that it's never been easier to be connected these days with the internet social media and all you've got to do is just get yourself out of there find out who are running matches and get linked into their web pages their um, Twitter feeds email addresses and websites so that when competitions come about you're the first one on the ball because of these competitions a lot of them are difficult enough to fish as it is but a lot of them the hardest part is actually getting on them so there's so many media channels out there some of my favorites obviously the bait tech YouTube channels brilliant because there's a nice share and mix of information on there from specimen anglers as well as match anglers you've also got the matrix TV YouTube channel which is brilliant again um, Craig Butterfield and, and Lewis Porter and the lads at matrix and Fox really keep that site that sorry that web page going and that's brilliant um, for for sharing information on products and tactics as well as regards media side of things the publications DHP do a great job they've got match fishing TV which is aired every week now I think that's on a Monday but they've got a YouTube that's on YouTube sorry but that's there are also links to that from their DHP website like the matchfishingmagazine.com and another one of my favorites is a channel that's run by Joe Carras who obviously as a lot of you know works for DHP and he runs a match um, match fishing films YouTube channel that's a little bit glossier than Mike because he's obviously using editing equipment that's different and that's what he does for a living he's very good at it it's brilliant but obviously he's a fantastic angler in his own right so check that one out so that's really it just get networked up and if anybody wants any links to any websites or any future competitions that I might know about just send me a message and uh, I'll send you the links so that was question one Well, a slightly different backdrop for question two, but it's one I've been asked quite a lot recently, and again, it's the question of braid or mono. There are so many reasons why you might select mono over braid and vice versa, and what I'll do, I will cover that as a subject on its own in probably maybe in next week's log. Um, it's not something I want to skip over because it's something that I put so much thought and time and effort into over the last 12 months or so that I really want to tell you why 
I've come to the decisions that I now make. It's something that's very, very personal. I know for a fact that even within the England feeder team, that some of the team will use braid, whereas others will use mono, even on this same scenario. So it's something I want to talk about properly. But that's question two. And like I say, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit of depth further on. So uh, now it's time for question three. Right, well question two was brought to you from a bull ring. A little bit different and a little bit different from uh, change of scenery for you instead of the tackle room. Question three, it's one I've been asked quite a bit and it has been covered before, but I will cover it again for those guys that, didn't, uh, that haven't seen the other coverage of it. It's basically about tip selection. As you know, a lot of us set of rods up at home now and a lot of that um, can, can, can cause problems when we get to the bank because you just want to get the rod out and just get fishing. Obviously that means you're at home and you're selecting tip choices just based on what you think or what you expect the venue is going to be like when you get there. Obviously it's not always the case. The way I get around that is when I get to my peg, once I set my, my box up, I set a rod rest up and if it looks like the wind's going to be bad or, or the or the, um, the, the tow and the wind's going to change or it's different from what I expected, all I do is just clip a bomb on, whack the bomb out to where you think you're going to be fishing or the expected range and put the rod down on the rod rest and then while you're setting up your, your bait trays and mixing your ground bait and all that sort of stuff just keep your eye on the tip, if the tip's going to be too soft for the conditions you can quickly realise that and change it obviously if it's right that's brilliant you don't have to change anything but if it does need changing that way you're changing it before the match starts and that's when you need to be doing it you don't want to be finding those things out during the match um, and that's question three if you, I mean things like that setting up and those sorts of details I can do a, a more extended vlog on things like that because they're the things that can really have a massive impact actually on your fishing um, so yeah question two was brought to you from a bull ring uh, this one's a little bit different I don't know if you can see them it's dark and I can't believe they've got the audacity to be cutting the grass but this basically is the technical area and dugout of the Bernabeu Stadium just a little bit of different scenery from uh, from the tackle room so that was question three so let's have a look at uh, gonna have a look at braid and mono choice in part three so hopefully you've enjoyed the surroundings see you back in the tackle room we're back in the tackle room braid versus mono I'm just going to touch on this subject, I won't, well I'll try not to go on and on about it. There's no straight answer, you've just got to understand why each one has, has its benefits on certain days and you've got to put that to the venue that you're going to and try and make an educated decision. There are even top anglers that still have dilemmas about what's the best to use in certain scenarios. All I can tell you is, I can tell you why I make certain decisions for certain scenarios and what the benefits are of each one and just let you make the decision sometimes you'll get it right sometimes you won't get it right it's just that's the way it goes sometimes so here we go mono for me I love using the cart master it's a great durable mono and I use that on the venues where braid isn't allowed or I'm tackling bigger fish and carp that's the mono that I try and go for whenever I can braid is submerged I'm not going to say that's the best braid in the world, all I can tell you is that is the braid that I use in every every situation and I also know there are a lot of top anglers that are sponsored by other companies and that's the only braid that they use so I, th I think that speaks volumes. The best way I can talk about using braid against mono is to use a simple scenario, in this case I'm going to use Southfield Reservoir, a lot of you know it, a lot of you don't, for those of you that don't it's a massive still water it's about 100 acres large it's about four feet deep it's prone to the elements you know sometimes it can be blowing you off the bank sometimes it's flat calm but that's the scenario i'm going to use range that you fish will also determine the way that your bites perform if you're using mono for example because they're stretching mono your bites won't be quite as easy to see as what they will with braid because braid there's no stretch there everything's much more direct Sometimes you want to see the bites early and you need to react early, especially if you're catching fish like roach and small, small silvers. Sometimes with bigger bream and even carp obviously, then a mono might be the best way to go because you're going to give the bites a bit more time to develop and when you do pick up, if it's a fish that's running, you've got some stretch there to hopefully prevent any sort of a hook pull. 
The range that you fish will also have an impact on the way that you the way that you hit your bites. If you're fishing with braid on a short line, you'll quickly know about it because everything's much more direct. If you're fishing with braid at a range less than 20 meters, you are so direct it's unbelievable. So if you're fishing a short line for big fish, maybe braid's not the way to go. I know a lot of anglers that any anything less than about 20 meters they'll fish with mono because on a lot of the UK fisheries especially, the fish that you're going to catch on a shorter line could be bigger fish. Sometimes they're the larger bream and obviously even carp on certain venues. So they opt for a mono just to give give them a little bit of a cushion on the pickup. On a venue like Southfield, it's only four feet deep, so your feeder is only dropping for about one or two seconds after the cast. Sometimes you can often find that some braids don't sink as quickly as mono does. On a venue like that, because the feed is only dropping for a, a second or two, as you can imagine, when it hits the deck, you've still got a lot of, of mono or braid still on the surface of the reservoir. A lot of people don't like that, but, you know, a lot of people like to have their braid or their rear line underneath the water as quickly as possible. So if you're fishing a shallow reservoir like that, and your braid's not sinking very quickly, mono might be the way to go, because it's going to sink quicker and get down underneath any chop or any waves, and just get you to set your tip a lot quicker. A shallow venue like Southfield, it's only four feet deep, as you can imagine, when the wind starts blowing, that can really affect the tow. And when you've had a few hours of that wind blowing, the tow can increase dramatically. If you're fishing a low diameter braid, for example, that is going to pick up less of the tow than what a mono will. That is something you need to think about, because obviously that's going to affect the way that you set your tip. If you're fishing with a mono, at any sort of range, when the tow's on, you're going to need a stronger tip. And that is also going to affect the way that your bites develop. If your tip's bent right round, it's harder to watch a bite develop. And that's when a little bit more technicality comes into it. Because you can almost begin in those scenarios to fish it like a drop back as you do on a river. But again, that's probably a subject for a different time. But these are all the things that you need to think about on venues where they can be dramatically affected by the weather. And that leads us into tip choice. If you're going to be fishing with a, a, a mono that's a thicker diameter that's going to pick up some tow, you're going to need a stronger tip. Obviously the other way around, if you're using a braid which is 0.08 or 0.10, it's going to pick up less of that drag so you can get away with a softer tip. These are all the little things that you need to take into account and it's all a very fine balancing act. One final thing that I want to mention is that especially on UK fisheries where carp are concerned and bigger bream, you often find that if you're going to put a short line in to fish later on in a session, that is when you can get bigger fish moving in. Sometimes you'll find that all your big fish will come on a short line like that later on in the session. One thing I can say to you, certainly from last year's experiences, were whenever those fish moved in onto that shorter line in the matches that I fished, they moved in for one reason, and that was to feed. And that meant that all the bites I got on that short line were positive. They'd come in to feed, they'd obviously found my feed, fed over it, and that's where I caught them. Every bite I had in certain venues like Larford and Barston and Southfield, the bites that I got on that short line were just, they almost hooked themselves. So, why would you use a braid in that sort of scenario? That's why one of the key things I learnt last year, you can use a mono, because you're at such short range, you're not really losing anything through sensitivity, you've got more cushion on the strike, especially on, on positive bites, <clears throat> and come on, let's be honest about it, if any of you out there like me, where you fish a leader that's about 8 metres long, if you're casting at, I don't know, 16 metres like we sometimes are, 8 metres of that is mono anyway because you've got a leader. So you're not really losing anything, are you? So that's just a personal thing for me that I learnt last year and that's something that I'll be taking forward into my matches this year. I've been away this week, as you know, but there are still been things out there on social media that I just want to bring up to you just to, just to highlight what's been going off. First one is Matrix, the Matrix online catalogue has gone online today which is fantastic, I'll put the link below to the Matrix website, loads of new products and even some of the existing products from, products from last year have been livened up a little bit, so please check that out, like I said I'll put the link below for you, exciting year ahead and some of the products you'll see in that catalogue I'll obviously have with me on the bank, so if you see me come and say hello and just have a look at them, if not if you can get along to uh, either the Northern Angling Show or the big one down near Farnborough, um, in April, that would be brilliant, just come along, you can pick them up and just have a look at them, see them in the flesh great catalogue and I believe it's in, you know, it's in several languages, I believe, I haven't had a chance to see it yet because I haven't even had my tea yet since I got home from work, but there you go 
And the next thing that caught my eye this week was the Angling Trust. They've got a new ticketing process, a new system for booking tickets for their competitions. I haven't used it yet because I haven't entered any of their competitions yet. But I had a quick look at the tutorial on YouTube and I think they've done a great job. If any of you guys are watching, top job. I haven't used it like I said, so it's only the tutorial and I've only seen it at face value. But it looks a good system, it's bang up to date now by the looks of it. So that should make that process a lot easier for you guys getting tickets for, for their competitions. One little detail from that I'd like to mention is that in order to purchase the tickets you've got to enter your, your fishing license number, which I think is a very interesting little detail. I like things like that, it just keeps everything official and uh, yeah, well done AT on that, but that's just my opinion. So yeah, great to see that system, I can't wait to be using it, I'm hopefully going to be, might be trying to get all the one or two Riverfest tickets uh, over the next month or so when they go on sale, so yeah, I'll let you know how, that's, how that system goes. And the final thing, I'm not saying I'm going to get excited about this, but have you ever had a massive amount of confidence in a particular ground bait? But there's always been something about it that you think, well, in, I really love this ground bait in certain situations, but in other situations, I wish I had the confidence in it so I could continue using it. Then you're the same as me, and that's exactly what's happened to me this week. We've been testing out a prototype ground bait for Bait Tech, and as a lot of you know, Special G Green has been one of the, uh, my main base mixers over the last 12 months, and you know it's won me quite a bit of money as well. It's, it's been brilliant. It's, like I said, I haven't always used it on its own. I mix other stuff with it, like salmon fry and give it fish meal boosts and things like that. But guess what was released this week? A dark version, Special G Dark. Absolutely brilliant. When I first found out that this was coming out, I was over the moon. I couldn't wait to see it. It's had uh, a couple of tweaks to it through testing. And, yeah, we've been catching fish on it. So if you're one of those anglers that, you know, you want a bit of a, a fish meal mix and you're more confident in darker mixes, especially in, in clear water, a lot of people use dark mixes all year round, um, then, yeah, please check that out. It, you know, it's something that we have been using and I'm going to be using that a great deal over the next uh, over the next few months. So I'll certainly let you know how that goes. So that's brilliant. It's a fantastic addition to, to the Bait Tech range. And um, big clap to Bait Tech for registering that uh, that there, there was a need for that sort of mix. And I think I'm quite happy with it. I like, I like it. I've been catching fish with it and it seems quite versatile. So yeah, you'll obviously hear about it. If it's been catching some fish over the next few weeks, you'll definitely know about it. So that's it from the Tattle Room. Right, well that's about it. Thanks again for watching, really appreciate it. But I mean, like I said, there hasn't been uh, any footage from the bank this week, but that's purely because I've been away. This is just obviously proving to you that wherever I am on holiday or wherever, I will be bringing something to you every Thursday that's hopefully got some fishing tidbits in there for you. Um, like I say, I will make up for it next week. I've got a double header this weekend coming. So I've got the Boston Masters on Saturday and then it's the Larford Grand Masters qualifier on Sunday so I'm away all, all weekend two matches so next week I'll have two matches for you as well as the vlog uh, on Thursday evening as normal so thanks again for all the views really appreciating it and uh, like I say there'll be a double dose of fishing for you next week so thanks again for watching have a great weekend and I hope you all empty it wherever you're off to